the key Bible verse this entire series is built around is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13. Let's say it out loud together wherever you are. You ready? Be alert. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Today, Ed Skipper, who leads Heart of Revival, a ministry dedicated to telling the story of Jesus and encouraging churches and pastors, will be sharing the message with us. You can find out more about Ed's ministry at heartofrevival.net. Let's pray, and then Ed will take the stage and share today's message. Heavenly Father, I thank you for Ed and his willingness and courage to always be ready to tell the story of Jesus and why Jesus is so important to our lives. Speak to each person who watches this exactly what they need to hear and what they need to do from this message. In Jesus' name, amen. In the movie Old Yeller, which was put out in the 1950s, a father has to go away and leave his homestead and leave the homestead to his wife and two sons. Now, while they're there, a dog comes onto the property and causes all kinds of havoc. The older son, Travis, grows to hate that dog and wants to kill it. But as time goes on, he changes and becomes very affectionate toward that dog who he dearly loves. Eventually, the dog, Old Yeller, has an encounter with a wolf and is bitten and goes crazy because the dog is infected. Travis has to shoot his beloved dog, and he is grief-stricken. Now, when Father, the dad, gets home from his trip, he tries to comfort his son, and these are some of the words that he shared. Now and then, for no good reason, a man can figure out, life will just haul off and knock him flat, slam him against the ground so hard it seems like all his insides is busted. But life's not all like that. A lot of, a lot of it's mighty fine. And you can't afford to waste the good part fretting about the bad. But I'll tell you a trick that sometimes is a big help. Start looking around for something good to take the place of the bad. As a general rule, you can find it. Travis eventually has a turnaround in his grief when he is able to see the pup from Old Yeller as an opportunity to be trained to be as loyal and as useful, as helpful as Old Yeller was. Well, let's talk today about finding something good in the bad when life hauls, hauls off and knocks us flat. Before I became a Christian, I was riding in a car in Eugene with a Christian friend of mine and other Christians in the car who I, whom I did not know. They were getting to know me, and one particular man asked me about my background. I told him that when I was 14 years old, my father had passed away, and that had been devastating in my life. And he asked me the question, how has God used that for your good? And I was floored. I was surprised at that question, and I faked some answer. I wasn't a Christian, and he was assuming that I was. But that question made a mark on me. It made a difference. The idea that God can take a tragedy and use it for good became a major factor in me coming to Christ. So let's listen to what the Scripture says about this in Romans 8, 28 and 29. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. For those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. Who does God work for the good of? Those who love Him and who've been called according to His purpose. Note number one, in whatever you face, God is working for your good, conforming you to the likeness of His Son. Now a cook takes flat-tasting flour and margarine or butter and raw eggs and bitter chocolate, 
None of those ingredients by themselves are very good. You've probably never been invited to dinner and been served one of those things as one of the dishes. But a cook is able to take those and some other ingredients and to put them together to make something good, as in chocolate cake. And that's what God does in our life. He takes the various ingredients that are very painful in and of themselves and uses us to make us better people, to be conformed to the likeness of his son. There is a poem about weaving that I think just states truth beautifully. It says, My life is but a weaving between my Lord and me. I may not choose the colors. He knows what they should be. For he can view the pattern upon the upper side while I can see it only on this, the underside. Now, we all know probably how messy and random a weaving appears from the underside. And yet, if you view it from the upper side, you recognize there's a pattern and a plan that's going on. And so it is with the Lord. He knows what he's doing in our lives. Part two of that poem, Not till the loom is silent and the shuttles cease to fly shall God unroll the canvas and explain the reason why. The dark threads are as needful in the weaver's skillful hand as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned. So we may not, we may not see the good that God is working out in our griefs, in our trials, and in our troubles, but we must believe that he is working for our good. Listen again to the Apostle Paul's words in Romans 8, 28 and 29. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. So in all that we face, the result can be, if we cooperate with God, becoming a better person. There's a small town in the south that made its living entirely from growing cotton many years ago. And the boll weevil came along and, and destroyed their crops such that they had to change and no longer grow cotton in that little town. And they went to peanuts and other crops that turned out, in the end, to be much more lucrative for them. So what did they do? They built a memorial to the boll weevil. <laughs> Thank you, boll weevil. <laughs> For what you did, as painful as it was at the time, ended up being for our good. And we can do the same thing in our own lives, knowing that God is using whatever we're going through to produce good in us, to conform us to the likeness of Jesus. So are there difficult people that you work with or that you live with? God is at work for your good. Do you have a spouse or a child or a parent or a roommate or a classmate who is selfish or difficult or wayward in that? God is at work for your good. Do you have financial problems, health issues? God is at work for your good in that. Watch what else the Apostle Paul says about sufferings. Over in Romans chapter 5, verses 2 to 5, again in Romans, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. We rejoice in our sufferings. Would you say, oh, I already do that. Rejoicing in my sufferings. That's nothing new to me. I have a feeling the answer is no. For most of us, this requires a change in how we think. How critical it is that we believe that in trials, God has a purpose, and his purpose is to refine us, to produce perseverance and character and hope. Note number two, because God develops perseverance, character, and hope through our sufferings, we can rejoice in them. 
It's not that we love the pain of our trials, but we love the gain that they bring so we can rejoice in them. Not everything that happens is good. There is still evil that happens to us, but God uses everything in our life, including evil, to bring about good. A change in our perspective about trials and how we view them and how we face them will absolutely turn our lives upside down for the better. But usually, we want God to do a removing job. God wants to do an improving job. We want him to take the things away that are disturbing and difficult for us. He wants to develop us through them. A man found the cocoon of an emperor moth and thought it would be fun to watch that moth emerge from the cocoon. So he took the cocoon home with him. And there was just a tiny little uh, prick hole in that cocoon. And the moth seemed to struggle so mightily to get out of that tiny hole, to get out through it. It was just too much. The, the hole was too small. The man had compassion on the moth and decided to get a pair of scissors and clip that hole to make it a little bit larger. The moth emerged, but when it came out, its body was bloated with fluid and its wings were shriveled and dry. The man expected over time that the body of this moth would fill out and it would fly. It never did. Why? Because the process of coming through that really tight hole forces the, the moth's fluid out of the body and into the wings, making it complete. And that moth never went through that process. Something similar happens in our life. Pressure is required in our life in order to make us whole. And if we don't have the pressure and the troubles and the hardship, we never become what God wants us to become. Note number three, hope leads to perseverance. Apostle Paul has just said that sufferings produce perseverance, character, and hope. Listen to what else he says in Philippians 4, 16 and 17 regarding hope. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. I don't know about you, but I suspect that light and momentary are not the words you would use to describe your trials. I imagine that Travis in the movie Old Yeller would not use the word light and momentary to describe his grief over his uh, dead dog. They seem heavy and they seem to last forever to us when we're going through them unless we hold them up against something else. The eternal glory. The life that is to come in the presence of Jesus that never ends. And when we look at our circumstances in light of eternity, then they are just like the snap of a finger or the blink of an eye. I need this perspective. When I'm going through hardship, I need to remember that this is light and this is temporary compared to eternity and that produces in me endurance when I do that. Last August, you could say like what Travis, Travis's father said, life slammed him to the ground. Life slammed me to the ground. I had a herniated disc in my neck that went uh, undiagnosed as people were trying to treat it. And it brought my life as I knew it to a complete halt. My ministry stopped. My family events stopped. All I could do was stay home to try to treat the pain in my shoulder blade and elbow and, and in my hand. What kept me going through that season? The hope, it was about six weeks long. What kept me going was the hope that one day 
this would be over and I would get better. If I didn't have that hope that there was going to be a better day coming in my life, it would have been hard not to get discouraged. It was hope that sustained me, and it's hope in our lives in general, the hope of eternity that sustains us. What a gift hope is so that we can keep going and persevere during trials. So change your perspective on things that happen in your life that are difficult. Don't dread them. Welcome them. Don't wish that they did not exist but be thankful for them because through them, God produces perseverance, character, and hope. And I close with this scripture, this series scripture, 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be men of courage, stay strong.